One of the great things about the Minor Prophets is it, it doesn't just tell you what God expects. It interprets what's going on in current history uh, according to what God wants. So, like, there would be an event happening. I don't know if I said that correctly, but there would be an event happening in history. The people would be confused about what was going on, and the, the prophet would come and interpret this is what's going on. See, we don't have that benefit today because there's a lot of stuff going on that we're confused by, and we wish that God would just come down and say, what are you doing in our nation around us? What are you doing in the nations of the world? We don't have that benefit, but in their time that they did. So when, when God delivered the, the law of Moses at Mount Sinai, he gave them their instructions, and then later on when they would get out of line, the prophets would come and say, okay, you remember what I told you at Mount Sinai? Well, this is why this is happening in the world around you, because you're not doing what you're supposed to, doing, supposed to be doing. What's interesting about Habakkuk is it's a little different. It's that The name means embrace, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And, and there's this progression through the book. He starts off being perplexed and confused about what's going on in the nation around him. So you could say it goes from a sob to a song. There's a transition in the mood of the prophet as, he, as we go through the book towards the end where he just breaks out in a songful prayer, a prayer set to music. So these are the questions that we could think about. Do we ever feel disappointed or perplexed by God? And I'm sure if you're honest with yourself, you look around, evil in the world, wickedness, why is God not doing anything about this? You, we're confused over God's dealings, don't understand why he's doing certain things. Why would he allow such wickedness to take place? And over time, we may lose confidence in his ability to do something about it, or at least his willingness to do something about it, because as we pray to God and say, God, why aren't you doing anything, and we don't see the answers that we want, we may think, well, is God really listening, or does he really care? Um, maybe you've just thought, God, you just don't make sense. You know? And um, you may think that that is, you may not even admit that to yourself, or you may not that admit that to me or one another, uh, because you may think that that is, somehow blasphemous to uh, question God, but there's examples in the Old, in the Old Testament and, and times throughout the Bible where people were genuinely confused about God and they expressed their confusion to God and it wasn't, as long as it wasn't a rebellious, it was just a genuine questioning and a confusion, God was very patient and often gave answers for that. So there's a lot for us to learn about this short uh, book of prophecy. As a way of introduction, we don't know exactly when it was written. Uh, many people think around 600 B.C., 610, 612 B.C. Sometime written probably before the Babylonian invasion of, the, of Judah. There's some clues to that in chapter 3 and verse 16 where the prophet says, I've, I've seen all this stuff, i got all these answers from God, and now I just have to wait until these people rise up to invade us. And if you know anything about uh, the history of the nation of Israel, they were judged by God, by the Babylonians. Most of you have had you know, history class in high school. You've heard about the great Babylonian Empire. God used the Babylonians to, to bring judgment against his nation of Israel. This is sometime uh, before that happens. The prophet uh, indicates in, in chapter 1, verse 4, that he's living in a land of wicked people. Now, he's talking about his own people here. This is the land of Israel that should be God's people, that should be righteous, that should uphold justice and mercy. But he's not seeing that. And so here's a man of God confused why God's not doing anything about it. And so, you know, we could look around in our own country and say, you know, what's all this going on around us? You know, we're supposed to be a nation committed, you know, one nation under God, you know, in God we trust, and we don't see that around us. Or maybe um, this could be a, a people living, you know, a, a godly person living among God's, God's people who's gone astray, and why aren't these people seeing the error of their ways? Very interesting to note about Habakkuk. Most other prophets are pleading God's case to the people, saying, thus says God, thus says the Lord. And there's some of that here, but there's, a, there's something very different about Habakkuk in that he is seeming to represent the people's confusion and plea to God. Why aren't you doing something about it? And so it's a, a different perspective than you'll see in many of the other prophets. And so the prophet questions God, uh, perhaps on behalf of the people. He's voicing the, not all the people, but the righteous remnant. And he's going to wait for God's answer. And again, there's this transition from doubtful confusion to this confident trust in God as we go along. We're going to look at three main sections of this letter. And I've divided it like this. You could divide it in a different way if you want, but other people have, have kind of divided it into three sections. You may say the burden, the, 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 the book starts out talking about, depending on your version, if you're there, it may say the oracle, it may say the burden. Well, an oracle or a burden, it's, it's, a, it's a message from God. 
And oftentimes when there's a message of judgment coming, it's a heavy load to bear. Imagine if God told me that you're going to die in a month, and it's my job to deliver that message to you. Wouldn't that be a, a burden to bear to tell somebody that horrible news, that that judgment was coming? Well, so many times in the Old Testament, the prophets, the prophet would get a burden. He would get an oracle from God. It was a heavy message that he had to carry. So we're going we're gonna to see the burden. We're going to talk about the vision from God. And then the last part is this, this prayer, which is set to a song um, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. So let's look at the oracle or the burden. Habakkuk, once again, I'm in chapter 1. We're going to be looking through um, here the first four verses. He's surrounded by evil and violence. He's confused and disappointed in God's lack of judgment against this evil, uh, especially among the nation of Israel. And he questions God. In other words, he's going to say, why aren't you listening? Why don't you save us from this evil? Now let's read 1 through 4, now that I've summarized it for you. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists, and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Imagine, you know, going to court and you can't get justice even in the court system where there's justice supposed to be. You can't, you can't, um, you know, the righteous people who should be uh, coming out on top, they're not. They're getting, you know, so you look around in the world around you and you're thinking, wow, everything is upside down from the way it's supposed to be. And where is God in this situation? Well, it's not unlike maybe we look around in our own society today. Where is, where, what is God doing here? Why is he letting people be so wicked? Why are, the, why are the righteous being oppressed? And I would say, yes, we probably do get discouraged by the wickedness that's around us uh, from time to time. And that's what, the, that's what the, the prophet here and generally the righteous remnant of people in Israel are experiencing at this point. Well, God is going to answer in verses 5 through 11. And to summarize this, he's going to tell them that God that he is doing something that is hard for them to understand. You wouldn't even be able to understand if I told you, in other words, God is saying this. He's going to raise up, check this out, he's going to raise up this wicked nation to judge a supposedly righteous nation who's gone wicked. Now that is just going to really twist their minds, because they're not going to understand how that is going to happen. And more importantly, at this point in history, more than likely, the nation he's telling him he's going to raise up is not even that mighty yet. So imagine if, if God says, you know, I'm going to raise up, I don't know, I hate to pick on a particular country that's small, but let's say I'm going to raise up Belize, and they're going to overthrow you or something like that. Some country at the time that's not, you know, at this point in history, Babylon was not always a great nation. Babylon was a small, insignificant part, started as a smaller part of the Assyrian Empire, and then grew in military strength and political influence and, and started conquering and then finally toppled over why were they able to topple over the Assyrian Empire? Obviously because of God, but because the Assyrian Empire had become wicked, and it become corrupt from within, and, it, and, the, and the underpinning and the foundation of their society was compromised, and then somebody else was able to come in. And so it's probably very shocking, number one, that the Chaldeans would be raised up as a great nation, number two, that God would use them because they're a wicked nation. It doesn't make sense in the, in the Jewish mind. So he's going to use a wicked nation that, that even thinks it's serving its own God. So they're not, this, this nation that he's going to use, Babylon, they're not even going to recognize that God is the one who's bringing them to power. They're going to be still worshiping their own pagan gods the whole time. And they're going to think, hey, look how big and bad we are. We're the Babylonians. So let's look at uh, verses 5 through 11. Here's what's God's answer when he says, Why are you waiting around for all this wickedness? And why aren't you listening to our prayers when the nation of Israel has gone wicked? Here's the answer in verse 5. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards. And keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, sweeping down uh, to devour. 
So all this is like, um, you know, poetic imagery of, of the greatness of their army and their wickedness. Number nine, uh, all of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like sand. They mock at kings, and rulers are, uh, are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it, uh, meaning that they don't respect any government, and everything is just a game to them. They're just going to, a greedy horde coming over the land. Verse 11, then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be guilty. So that's an important thing to note. It's not that they're righteous. They're going to be held responsible. They whose strength is in their God. Now this is going to, like I said, this is a confusing statement. And wouldn't you be confused too? I would be confused if God raised up a wicked nation to judge us. Now, in the, in the political climate today, you, there's always talk about, you know, this, this country went through like a big Cold War, you know, before my time. Uh, I guess it ended, you know, you know, around my time, but before my time. Russia, the United States, you know, and we're in, in God we trust. We're the Americans, you know, and God's behind us, and, and we're like this holy nation. Well, imagine if God told us that he was going to raise up another country, a wicked country, a country that we would have no problem sending people to fight against because they're wicked, but God says, you know, I'm going to raise these people up, and I'm going to judge your nation. Wow. Wouldn't that be a slap in the face? Wouldn't that be like a, that would just twist our whole way of thinking. And that's what the prophet's feeling like right now. He doesn't understand why God would use such a wicked instrument to execute his justice. And that brings us to, to verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, through the end of this chapter. He questions God again, and he says, how can a holy God use a wicked servant? Or how can a pure God use an impure people to bring about his wrath? The Chaldeans, in other words, they're more wicked than Israel is. And so the prophet can't understand... But he's going to watch and wait for the Lord to respond. And he also says, and probably correct him, and probably reprove him, because he, he's almost feeling like, there's some language there, he's always feeling like, who am I to question God? You know, I'm probably he's going to bring the smack down on me and, and just straighten me out. But he, he's really confused. And so there's this, there's this tension here. He's living in this wicked society, and imagine this, you know, like we're living in like a, a United States of America, and Let's say wickedness is, is rising from generation to generation, and we're thinking, when is God going to bring justice upon this nation? He can't let this go on forever. I don't understand that the righteous people who are trying to do right can't get ahead, and they're overrun with wickedness. And what if God said, I'm going to raise up this evil nation to, to overthrow and to bring judgment? That would be a, blow our mind, because we're stuck between wanting God to bring justice and not wanting to be judged by this wicked, evil nation. So... <clears throat> that's kind of what they're going through here. So now that I've kind of summarized it, let's look at uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through the, end, through the end of the chapter. He says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? You will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct or to bring correction. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Talking about the Babylonians. Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up the more righteous than they? Doesn't make sense. Yes, Israel's bad. Our people are bad, but they're not as bad as these people who, who you're going to judge us by. Number 14. Why have, you ma why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a rule, ruler over them? Meaning, meaning they're just like a fish in a pond waiting to be snatched out by a hook. Verse 15, the Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their nets, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net. Meaning they're not even giving credit to God. Isn't that amazing? Like, So here's God's people going to be judged. Yeah, we're bad, but we're not as bad as these people. And they're not even going to recognize you for it. You know, that, 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 you know, when you, when you give, them into, give us into their hand, he says, because through these their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? Is God going to continue to let this happen? Well, I love what he does in chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And how I may reply when I'm reproved. I like that little last part there. So he questions God, 
And then he's going to go out on the city wall somewhere, a high place, perhaps even looking north to, to the direction which the Babylonians will be coming. You know, I'm going to see if they, if he's, what, what he's going to say to me. Or maybe he's looking east to the sunrise. We don't, we're not told. But he seems to be going out and waiting on the Lord's response. And also he's waiting on his whipping. He's waiting on his, perhaps, his correction to, to God to straighten out his thinking in some way if he's, if he's mistaken. Because he is a prophet and he does want to speak for God. But he doesn't have, I don't know how long he has to wait, but the vision is going to come. come. I said he doesn't have to wait too long. We're not told there, so I don't want to say that. The next part is the vision that he gets. And this is chapter 2, starting in verse 2. And, these, and this vision is going to answer all this confusion and questions which we've talked about up to this point. An interesting thing for you to do would be to go through the book and just find the question marks. All the questions that Habakkuk does and all the rhetorical questions that God uses in his response to Habakkuk. But here's what he's going to say. <coughs> Basically, he, Habakkuk is, is going to be instructed, let's read verse 2, to write everything that he sees. The Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. Now, this verse is in the Hebrew is confusing, and depending on what translation you have, it'll be say, saying different things. Some translations say, I want these letters to be so big that somebody can read it as they're running, out of, running away. Some of them say, I want this to be inscribed on a tablet and handed to a courier to run it throughout the kingdom so that everybody knows what God's doing. Um, some people say, I, I want this to be read plainly so that when I give it to somebody and they read it, they'll know to run. You know? So depending on how your translation reads it, um, you know, we don't know for sure, but what we do know is that if this was supposed to be recorded and since we have it, it was recorded, obviously. And the answer is going to be in three main parts. <clears throat> God's judgment is coming. You ask me about, can I, how long can I just listen to prayers and not answer? Don't worry about that. The judgment is going to come, and it's not going to delay. Same idea that you may see in the New Testament, 2 Peter 3. Everybody says the judgment's not coming? Oh, it's coming. The second part is, the righteous are going to live by their faith. And that's a New Testament concept that's used multiple times. The righteous will live by their faith. It's not just saying the righteous people are going to live by saying, I believe in God. It, has, it carries the idea that the righteous will live by their faithfulness. Those who are faithful versus those who are wicked. And then finally, he's going to talk about what's going to happen to the wicked. Again, all these things are answering Habakkuk's questions to God as he lives in this, in this uh, wicked nation. He's confused and perplexed about what God is doing. So, let's um, look at uh, verse 3. He says, For the vision is yet, is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. It will not fail. It will not fail. So it is coming. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come. It will not delay. In verse 4, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, or upright within him. Uh, but the righteous will live by his faith. And so there's a contrast here. This is probably one of the most famous verses in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2.4. He's contrasting the one who's proud versus the one who is righteous. The one whose soul is not right versus the one whose soul who is right. And there's this idea of the one, the, the one who's, who is proud. Your translation may say his soul is not upright or it is, it's not... Um, it's not sound. That, that idea is contrasted between, between the faithfulness of the one who is right. And um, so any, anyway, we could talk more about that afterwards, but there's this idea that a righteous person who remains faithful will be saved through any judgment that's going to be coming. And then again, he's going to turn to the wicked. Here's what's going to happen, not only to Israel, the wicked in Israel, but also to the wicked in Babylon. And before we go into that section, I want you to notice here that the vision is going to contain five woes against the wicked. Woe to this, woe to him, woe to him, woe to him, five times. And it doesn't specifically mention the Chaldeans, but from the context, it most likely refers to the Chaldeans. I'd go back and forth. I'd say, well, is he talking about woe to the, to the Israel that's going to be judged? No, I think he's talking about from the context and the description, he's talking about the Chaldeans. And... Here's the important thing for us to learn today, that these woes are describing characteristics of world powers that get too big for their britches. You know, so we used to say that in the South. I don't think they say that in the North. They're, they're too arrogant and proud, and God's going to bring judgment on them. 
And so these same principles we could apply to our country, we could apply to any of the other world countries today that are, that are big and powerful. If they get arrogant, if they do these things, then God will bring judgment on them. And we can know this because God has dealt the same way throughout time with all nations. In fact, these apply to the, the nation of Egypt. You know, it was a big world empire and, and came down and fell. Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, if you study ancient cultures, all these rose to power. God used them for his purposes. They got arrogant, and then God would bring them low to display his glory. Same thing happens over and over and over today. The difference is we don't have a prophet to tell us and interpret our current world events and what God is doing. But we can learn about, him, learn about God and how he deals with countries based on how he dealt with people in the past. God doesn't change. He deals with the same nations the same way today as he did then. So, let's look at these woes. The first woe in Habakkuk chapter 2, starting in verse 5, it's woe to greedy conquest and plunder. Now, we see a lot of that still today, don't we? Greedy conquest and plunder, uh, 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 the greed uh, of a nation that drives it to go and expand its territories. He says here in verse 5, Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man. He talked about the proud man in verse 4. The wine is going to betray this person so that he does not stay at home. In other words, he's going to get drunk on greed. He's going to get drunk on power. Um, and he's going to be going out and enlarging his uh, kingdom. So notice the next, says, the next thing says, he enlarges his appetite like Sheol, meaning the grave. Do, does, does, um, does the ground ever get full of, of bodies? No. People still die. The ground is always, you know, that, that's this, this imagery here that's saying that, that he's enlarging his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. You know, death is never satisfied. People are always dying more and more. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. Will not all these take up a taunt song against him? In other words, as Babylon exp extends his empire, or as countries today extend their empire and they trample on people as they expand out, are they not making enemies for themselves to come back to bite them eventually? And that's what's going to happen here to Babylon, and the same works today. He's collecting uh, enemies to himself. They're going to take up a taunt against him, verse 6. He says, And say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long and what makes himself, uh, sorry, for how long and makes himself rich with loans? This is what the people are going to be saying. Verse 7, Will not your creditors rise up suddenly, and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them. Because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the people will loot you. So there's a, a, twisted, a twisting ir irony that's going to occur. They've looted others, so they're going to be looted back. Because of human bloodshed and violence done to this land, to the, to the towns and all its inhabitants. So this is a, uh, the first principle of how God deals with greedy and plunderous nations. So you don't have to worry about God's judgment. Again, Habakkuk's question was, how can you let this wickedness happen? God's answer is, don't worry. Judgment's going to come upon wicked and uh, greedy nations. Well, the second woe is, woe to him who seeks security through evil, evil gain. And I like the analogy here that if I took your wallet to install and, and stole all your money to install a burglar system for my house, I've tried to increase security for my house by plundering your house. And that's the idea. <clears throat> nations do this too. They'll plunder other nations' assets and resources take other people's things and try to build security for themselves. God's saying judgment or woe to them who do that. Let's look at 2, verse 9 through 11. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high. That's what a bird does. He builds a nest really up high. It's supposed to be secure away from snakes and other vandals. <clears throat> to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You've devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many people's. So you are sinning against yourself. So when we take advantage of other people to bring security for ourselves, we're not helping ourselves like we think we are. We're really hurting ourselves. And nations do the same thing. He's saying when a wicked nation like Babylon, or it applies today, goes out and they try to rob from others to build their own security, let's say we go out and we conquer Mexico, we enslave them all to build a big border wall around the United States. You know, We're trampling on another people to try to build security for ourselves. That's what the Babylonians were doing. You could go back and look at pictures of ancient Babylon. They had these huge, high, and thick walls that would go on for miles and miles and miles. How were they built? Slave labor from the people they conquered. When they conquered Israel, what did they do with the people? 
they took them back to Babylon to work on construction projects. When the Egyptians conquered the Israelites and, and enslaved them, what did they do? They made them build the pyramids and cities. And so any, any country that, that tries to secure themselves on the backs of others, God's going to judge them. So here is the, the, the third woe. It's woe to him who builds himself up on the misery of others. And this involves that enslavery of other people, people who it's, uh, it's bloodshed, it's misery, it's imprisonment. Habakkuk 2, 12 through 14. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed <coughs> and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? Verse 13 is interesting. And I think it means this. The language is kind of confusing depending on what translation you look. But it has that idea that you read about in Ecclesiastes that nations are going to toil and toil and toil for, to build bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the end, what profit is going to? It's all going to burn up anyway. And that's the idea. It's an it's a, it's a act of futility to go and try to exploit other people to build yourself up because God's going to judge you in the end. And verse 14, For the earth w will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a climax here. Because what he's saying is, <clears throat> God's justice demands this judgment. If I, could, I hope I said that right. God will be glorified. How? By bringing judgment upon these people. He must judge these people so that his, all the world knows that he is a just and righteous God. So you don't have to worry about how long it's going to happen. It's going to happen. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God because it must, his justice and his judgment demand it. <clears throat> now, the, the, the next woe is, woe to him who takes advantage of his neighbors. And there's this analogy here in verse 15 through 17. It's almost like a guy who, um, and maybe you know people like this, or you knew you know, older people, you may know people still like this, or used to know people like this in college or something. The kind of guy that would go and knock on his neighbor's door, girl lives next door, tries to get her drunk so he can take advantage of her. Trying to take advantage of a neighbor. It's this, it's this idea of, getting someone drunk so that it exposes their nakedness and trying to make, make themselves feel good about their conquest. He's using this imagery to say that this is going to come back and bring shame on you. And that's what they don't realize. They think that they're clever by doing this. And he's using this in, in, in picture. This is what the, this is, that, that imagery that I'm just sharing with you, that's just like what this nation is doing by taking advantage of its neighbors and trying to make them you know, metaphorically drunk and take advantage. In verse 15 through 17, he says, <clears throat> Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, as so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. So don't think that you're doing something special. You're going to be, this disgrace is going to come back to get you. Now you yourselves drink and expose your own nakedness. And some versions say your own circumcision, meaning which represents their unrighteousness in this point in history. <clears throat> the cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. Verse 16 is very graphic. Most translators don't, don't catch this, but the idea of it's going to be spewed upon them, this idea of having a... <clears throat> imagine I'm a Babylonian king, and I'm, I'm taking advantage of other countries, and they're coming into my presence, and I think I've really done a, 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 a great... I'm really smart that I've got these other people drunk on my power, and now I'm taking advantage of them. Well, what happens to sometimes when you, you see in the movies when a guy tries to uh, take advantage of a girl and get her drunk, and then she ends up puking all over him, you know? He thought he was very smart, but in the end, he got puke on him. And some translations capture this. There's going to be spewing out of, uh, does anybody raise your hand? Anybody, maybe King James or somebody else says that, that, that you're going to have basically spew up on, on your glory here. Uh, that follows the analogy of coming back to bite them in the end. So, <clears throat> let me read verse 17. For the violence done in Lebanon will overwhelm you, and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrify them, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants. So all these things that they've, they've been doing, it's going to come back to them. So let's recap. These are principles that apply to Babylon, but today. The country goes out, gets greedy on its bloodlust for power and conquest, starts building up its own security on the backs of other people, enslaving other people, taking advantage of them in order to make themselves look good and build up their own glory, uh, try to get other people drunk on their own, their neighbors, neighboring nations drunk on their own power, getting them to submit to them, and in the end just taking advantage of them. And then the last one is, woe to him who worships idols. 
And in a larger context, <clears throat> there's something more significant about this than just people uh, bowing down to a statue. Because there has to be something that applies to us today. I want to make sure I say that and communicate that right. Oftentimes when I look at uh, Old Testament worship to idols, I quickly dismiss it because I'm thinking, oh, that doesn't apply today. I would never do that. I would never bow down to a wooden statue and think it's something. But there is something deeper going on here. It's the idea of not recognizing true deity, not recognizing true God, but rather forming God into an image that I want him to look like. That's what an idol really was. I want God to look like me so that he agrees with what I'm doing. That way I don't have a problem with God. God's on my side. Whatever I do, my God is just going to be on my, on, on, you know, behind me. So that's what people often do is that they build a, a God for themselves, either in their mind or physically. And people do that today. Even Christians sometimes do that. They want God to look like the way that they think it is rather than what he really is to make themselves feel better. So they're worshiping this idealized, they're basically worshiping themselves when they do this. And it represents uh, materialism in some way, or fleshliness, or worldliness. Look at verse 18 through 20. What profit, or what benefit is the idol when its maker has carved it? You know, when you create your own God, what benefit do you have? Can a man save himself? No. So why should I make my own God? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. And that's the key here. When we, when we make a God to look like ourselves, we're trusting in ourselves. We're making it in our own image. And we should never do that with God. Verse 19, Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake, meaning praying to a, a piece of wood to, um, to save him, to a mute stone arise, and that is your teacher? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver. There's no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You may have heard this verse. This is another famous verse. And we have a song about this as well. I think it's the only song in our songbook from Habakkuk. And uh, it's important to notice what this verse really means. There's a contrast between the real God who's at work versus the God who they think is at work, which is not. They're really worshiping themselves. There's also a contrast here. Uh, I say, what is the meaning of all this? God is not asleep. He is in his temple, so be silent. With the idol worshiper, it's the other way around. If I'm an idol worshiper, I'm doing all the talking, and the God is silent. So we never have a problem, do we? We never have a problem with God because he does whatever I say. He's saying, God is in his temple, you be silent, and you recognize who God is. Isn't that clever? Yeah, it's very poetic imagery. So this is an interesting answer to all of Habakkuk's questions. In summary, God may use wicked nations for his purpose. However, they're not going to go unpunished. They will get punished. Meanwhile, the just or the righteous people, they will live by their faith or their faithfulness to God. And God's not asleep just be quiet. You know, he's got everything under control. You need to recognize his authority for who, for who he is and wait on the Lord. This is really what he's doing when you look back at chapter 2 and verse 1. After he questions God and he says, I'm going to wait for God's answer, he's recognizing that God's in his holy temple. And he is being silent waiting for God's answer. So the, the, the prophet here, even though he's perplexed, he still recognizes God's authority. So he's not in the wrong for doing that. I think it's He's a wonderful example of what God is wanting us to do as well. So the question is, at this point in the book, how will Habakkuk respond to this news? Wow. Imagine God says, Americans, you know, the evil empire on the other side of the ocean is coming to judge you. And we think, am I supposed to be happy about that? Am I, supposed to, am I going to be scared about that? I'm conflicted because the righteous are going to be saved by their faithfulness. Okay, I got that. But yet, there's a judgment coming. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> so um, how do I feel? You know, how is the prophet going to feel? Well, I ask you this question. He breaks out in a prayerful song, which I think is a, what a lesson it is to us as we read this, as we read this song of deliverance. What is this prayerful song about? It's written in the, in the form of a psalm, if you were to read it, 
ver chapter 3 and verse 1, it, we ind it indicates very specifically that it is a prayer according to uh, Shigionath, I don't know what that is, um, a highly emotional, poetic form of a, of a prayer. Uh, and then verse 19 indicates that it's set to music because the last thing <clears throat> says it's for the choir director on stringed instruments. So we know it's a prayer, and we know it's a song. We normally call that a psalm. <laughs> and so that's, that's what it is. It's a petition for God's action and his mercy. It's, it's, a, it's a realization that he's seen God's will, it's coming, and, he's, and the prophet is behind him. He's not arguing with God, he's accepting what God wants, and he's asking God to come and bring that judgment, but also to remember mercy. I know you're going to do this, I'm with you, but just, just remember your, your faithful ones. Uh, in his wrath, remember mercy, uh, chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's, let's look at, um, let me read the first couple verses. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianath, which I think is a form of prayer, meaning an emotional prayer, it's poetic. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so that's God's plea. It's kind of like if your parent's going to give you a spank and you say, yeah, I, know, I know it's going to happen, but take it easy on me. You know, be, be, be easy. Uh, verse 3. God comes from Tehan, and this is this is what he's uh, this is introducing a new section of the of the song. He's going to praise God for his past deliverance. He's going to remember God's mighty works in the past, and there's going to be a mix of flood imagery. Remind reminds me of the the great flood that covered the earth in Noah's day, along with this approaching army. So it is switched back and forth between flood coming to sweep away and bring judgment and also this nation that's quickly coming to sweep and bring judgment. So that imagery is mixed. And then he's going to show that God's judgment is twofold. <clears throat> and God's judgment is always twofold. The righteous welcome God's judgment. The wicked fear God's judgment. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. If we are righteous, we don't have to fear God's judgment. If we're wicked, then we fear God's judgment. You see that? And so... It, it, it is, if you think about the flood during Noah's day, if you're, if you're familiar with that story, the earth was wicked, the judgment came in the form of a flood, it separated the wicked who were destroyed from the boat carrying the righteous that rose to the top. It separated the, the wicked and the righteous, and that was deliverance. The righteous welcomed that judgment, it separated them from the wicked people, but the, the wicked were destroyed. Now, fast forward to Habakkuk's day. Here he is, the righteous remnant, Wondering, he's living in a, man, a land of a wicked people, wondering, when's the flood coming? You know, when is the, in, this, in this case, it's the Babylonian army that's going to come and flood and sweep away wickedness. But that's going to separate the wickedness from the righteous. <coughs> so let's read this section here, um, 3 through 12. God comes from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. His, splendid covers, his, his splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. His rays uh, flash from his hands, and there, is, uh, and there is the hiding of his power. That's an interesting phrase. So God is brilliant when he comes in judgment, and his hands conceal it. But when he opens his hands, see, that's where his, his, in his hands where is where he was hiding it. And when he releases it, it comes out. King James uses a different word other than rays. I think it's, he talks horns. But this idea of like his powerful judgment is in his hands, is concealed, and then when he releases it, it's magnificent. Verse 5, <clears throat> Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth, and looked and startled the nations. Yes, the, splint, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. The idea of God is so magnificent that all the creation trembles around him. Imagine God appearing in his glory and bringing judgment. And even, even the waters shake and the mountains cr crash. It's just a, this great imagery that's happening. Verse 7, I saw the tents of Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. And then verse 8. <coughs> well, let me, let me go, go over um, down to verse 15. <coughs> Did the Lord rage against the rivers? And I think this is where he talks. he's moving into that flood analogy, going back and referring to Noah's day. 
did the Lord rage against the rivers, or was, the, was, was your anger against the rivers, or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare, meaning he shot his bow and there's no longer an arrow in it. The rods of chastisement were sworn, meaning he swore his oath to bring judgment. You cleaved the earth with rivers, meaning they're, they're everywhere. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. So water's coming from everywhere, up and down and, and sideways. Verse 11, sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the, at the light of your arrows. So once he shot his arrow of judgment, all light went away, and now it's just this imagery of this water coming from everywhere to bring judgment on the wicked. At the radiance of your gleaming spear, in indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. So there's two things happening here, you see. Great judgment coming upon the wicked, but also great salvation for his people. That's why he's coming in judgment. In verse 13, in the ending, he says, You struck the head of the, of the house of the, of the evil to lay him open uh, from thigh to neck. The idea of what somebody, a warrior would do in battle when he slices somebody with a sword to kill them. Verse 14, You pierced with his own spears. How ironic is that, to take a man's spear away from him and, and pierce him with it. Uh, we have some idea of people in the, in, there was one of the judges who did that, went down into a valley, took his own spear and pierced him. The head, of his, the head of his throngs, they stormed in to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses, on the surge of many waters. So the imagery there in verse 15 is that God's judgment came on the back of waters, like, like horses riding on the back of water. Anyway, that, that's taking us up to verse 15. In verse 16 and following, he says that, that he trembles at what he's heard. This is the end of the vision, and now it's talking about his reaction. Habakkuk has seen this great vision of judgment coming, which is salvation and judgment of the wicked, and he's going to wait quietly for this coming judgment. If I read verse, 13, uh, verse 16 of chapter 3, he said, I heard, what did he hear? All the stuff that God had just told him. I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. I find this ironic because in the midst of this joyful song, he's still torn with emotion that a judgment is coming. So while he is praising God for his coming judgment, which is going to bring salvation, yet he knows that there's this anxious anticipation of it coming as well. Uh, and this is very interesting. In verse 17 through 19, a great statement of faith. While trouble is going to come and things don't work out right for him and everything looks like it's, it's going wrong, Yet he is going to rejoice in the Lord. Now that is the example, that is the main lesson for us here. Verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, everything's going wrong here. No food, no cattle, no nothing. Imagine you lost your job, you lost your wife, you lost your house, you lost your car. He's going to rejoice in God? You know? You know, the, 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 uh, the food assistance from the government drives up. Everything is going away from you. There's judgment coming from every direction. You can't get ahead in any way you go. There's a decision to be made here. There's a choice that we all have to make. What, who are we going to trust in? What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Verse 18, he says... Yet I will exult in the Lord, or I will exalt him or glorify him. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Why, why can he do that? Because he knows that in the midst of everything, that the floodwaters around him, that God is going to save the faithful one through it. Notice his, his statement of faith there in verse 18. I will rejoice in the God. How does he describe God? He's the God of his salvation. It's the God that's going to save him through it. Verse 19, the Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet. This, this, this idea of he has given strength to my legs that I could climb up a hill like a, like a billy goat or a mountain goat or something like that. Just strong hind legs, and he can take me above all this trouble. And he makes me walk on my high places. What a great statement of faith for us. Here Habakkuk has started out perplexed, 
living in a wicked nation around him, not knowing what God's going to do. God's not listening to the prayers. How could he let this happen? And the same thing we could think about today in our society, right? Wickedness all around us. Is God asleep at the wheel? Why is he letting it happen? Well, we don't know what God's doing. We probably wouldn't even understand it if he told us. But yet we can still have faith in God that he's the God of our salvation. And chances are things are going to get worse. If he decides to bring judgment upon this nation, it's going to bring some discomfort on those, even the righteous. They're going to be tested in some way. Just like Habakkuk said, even though all these things will happen around, he is still going to maintain his faith. So what can we learn from this short book? Well, I just mentioned this, but I'll recap. We're not going to always understand what God is doing. But we can have confidence that he will judge and that his judgment will be twofold. It will be to save the righteous and condemn the wicked. We can also know that evil is self-destructive. That's why we don't go after evil. Look at all the things that the evil was doing in this chapter. It was bringing upon, it was trying to get ahead, but in, in the end it was all vanity. It was coming back to bite himself, you know, bite itself. So that's the idea here. Don't be tempted after evil because evil is only going to bring self-destruction. God is going to bring judgment upon wicked nations, even if he uses wicked nations to judge his people. And this is an important lesson for us to think about. We've, we've enjoyed the, the, the benefit of living in perhaps the greatest empire of all time, you know. Uh, some might say this patriotism like the United States is the greatest country. It'll never fall. Well, what happens when it does? Every other nation has fallen. How are we going to respond when it does finally fall? It may not happen in our lifetime. It may. But will God's people see that as a rejection from God? Are they going to embrace it as a judgment and know that they, if they are faithful, will be carried through? Our persevering faith or our faithfulness will save us. Uh, the righteous shall live by faith. Before I close, I want to share a couple New Testament verses that borrow upon this. The first one's Romans 1.16, which you know the very first part very well. The last part is confusing. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation, that's that idea, again, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that's the, confusion. That's the confusing phrase. When we study that, we're always thinking, what's he talking about from faith to faith? But he, he gives some commentary. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now that we've studied Habakkuk and understand the context in which that verse came from, I think we might be able to understand more, more about what he's saying in the first part of verse 17. God's righteousness, the righteousness of God which demands a twofold judgment, Judgment upon wicked, but also salvation of those who have faith in him and remain faithful. That righteousness is going to be revealed. All the earth will know the glory of God when he reveals that righteousness. It will cover the earth like the, ways of the, like the oceans of the sea, is what we learned about in Habakkuk. It's revealed, basically, it's where our faithfulness meets his faithfulness. As we remain faithful to him, he in turn is faithful and, 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 and is faithful to us in, in, in response to that. And if you think about it, it is like an embrace, which is what Habakkuk's name means, isn't it? Embrace Habakkuk uh, from a sob to a song. So as we embrace God, he embraces us back. As we're faithful to him, he's faithful to us. And the last verse I want to share with you is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, which also uses this verse. There's another one, Galatians 3.11. We're not going to look at that one. Hebrews 10.35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which is what Habakkuk was considering doing. Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Isn't that what we're talking about? That's what Habakkuk is all about. Yet for in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, which is what Habakkuk was talking about. Judgment's not delaying. <laughs> Verse 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. See, 37 and 38 is not just one Old Testament reference. It's a medley of Old Testament references all mixed in together and interwoven. But the idea here is, Verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith 
to the preserving of the soul. And that's, that's what the Christian looks forward to is the same thing we learned from the lesson of Habakkuk is we need to continue to persevere in faith even though there's all this wickedness around us. We can have confidence in God. And so let's embrace God more tightly and so that he will embrace us. Uh, as, we, as we increase our faithfulness, he's going to remain, continue to remain faithful to us. The invitation is simple. Let's stop sobbing and let's start singing. You know, that's... That's what we need to do in, in, our, in our Christian walk. If you're a Christian here today and, you, and you've been discouraged about all the things that are going wrong around you, the time is to look towards the salvation that God's going to bring and restore our confidence in God that he's going to make everything all right. All he needs you to do is just keep hanging on and, and place your trust in him and, and, and sing the, the prayerful song uh, to him and, and rejoice uh, of what he's doing. We may not always understand it, and we're not. There's so many questions that we don't know about what God is doing and what he will do. And as we study the Bible, like, you know, sometimes this stuff just doesn't make sense. But we, can't, we don't have to be smart to just place our complete and utter trust and faith in God. The people in the Bible, they weren't, you know, highly educated oftentimes. Fishermen, you know. But it doesn't matter how much education or even... Uh, sometimes the people who know the Bible the best and have, have the most raw Bible knowledge can have lesser amount of faith than somebody who just blindly just, I trust you, God, and I put what, the, the, what, what I know I'm going to put to work in, in my life. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, if you're subject to the invitation this morning, if you need the prayers of the saints or want to become a child of God, uh, repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ, we invite you to do that. But the song of invitation this morning is one of, let's stop sobbing and let's start singing. And uh, that's why I requested Gary to lead number 581, which is a proclamation of, of, of holding on to our faith and may it continue to increase. Let's sing. Oh, for.